All right. So it looks like we got over 100 people today. So this is going to be fantastic. Nice. Um, um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'll be very brief, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, please try to keep your microphones on mute so we can all hear Alan as he gives his presentation. Um, if you have any questions throughout the program, feel free to throw them in the chat box. Uh, we are recording this, and so uh, we'll make the recording available later if you'd like to watch it again or have. Um, a friend or family member who couldn't make it and wants to watch it, you can share it with them. Um, and with that, I will get off the microphone and hand it over to Alan so we can get started. Okay, and let's see, I'm un unmuted. Um, <coughs> what do you see right now? Do you see me? Yes, we see everybody's faces. Everybody, okay. Um, so, well, first of all, I want to welcome you, you guys to this uh, event. We do this every winter, a, a week before the what's called the Great Backyard Bird Count. In the past, we've uh, met physically uh, at the um, Willow Creek Hatchery in Edmonds, uh, usually with uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 people. Um, today, we have close to 100. Um, that's incredible. Um, what I hope to do in the next half to one hour is to inspire you all to to do two things next week, okay? Number one, count birds wherever you like. And number two, submit your counts to the Great Backyard uh, uh, Count Bird Site. Um, what we're gonna do in the next uh, few minutes here is go through those, some of those steps. Um, this is oriented toward um, what I call beginning birders. And I'm still on the, uh, maybe the higher end of the beginning birder side of, of life. Uh, I'm not a professional or a high powered birder. There's a lot of birds I can't identify, but I can identify some uh, 80 species of birds that have been through my backyard in the past 20 years. Um, and most of them of course are common, but there are always some rare ones that are interesting. So again, we're gonna focus on uh, beginning birding, uh, getting uh, fired up to do the great backyard bird count next weekend, and then hopefully getting more people to continue to do uh, backyard uh, uh, birding. Um, and it's not just backyard, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna go through a, a short PowerPoint about the great backyard bird count, and here we go. Um, Sure. Okay. And maybe somebody, Brian, you can guide me on what you see at the moment. Slideshow, play from start. Okay. You see That's the good. slideshow? Yep, looks good. Okay. So next weekend, starting on Friday, February 12th, 12th through Monday, the 15th, that's four day weekend, um, you uh, are going to participate in the Great Back Bird Count, I hope. We'll see. <laughs> um, that's, I'm trying to figure out how to get this PowerPoint to work. Why isn't it working? Hmm. Come on, there we go. Um, great Backyard Bird Count, it's called. It's about a, a 20 year adventure now, uh, starting in the United States, but now it's expanded to the whole world. Um, and there's a, a course that you can take for some of the data entry things called, one is called eBird. If you're not familiar with it, you will be uh, when you get involved in this whole little process. Uh, what you need to do is count birds wherever you like, starting at midnight on uh, uh, Friday morning uh, next week. You can, your backyard, patio or porch, um, city streets, parks, nature centers, uh, anywhere you'd like. Um, and I would even like to add things like if you go to Costco and you're, you're headed toward waiting in line to uh, get into the store, you might see four or five species of birds. And if you're in line for 15 minutes, write them down and when you get home, uh, enter them into the checklist uh, systems that uh, you'll, you'll learn more about. Um, but again, the reason to participate in this, it's, it's what I call a synoptic uh, global survey of birds. It's a, a one 
small period of time, birds are counted by thousands and thousands of people all around the world, including the United States and including uh, Washington State. Um, the data um, go into a da major database that uh, scientists at uh, all of them are back east use to remap and every year where birds are and begin to study how things like climate change are affecting the, the movement and migration of birds. Um, they can't, scientists can't be everywhere, but um, thousands of people can. Plus, I think it's fun. <coughs> you can participate from anywhere in the world. So if you're going to Hawaii next weekend, as uh, soon as you land and you check in and you're uh, clustered in your 14 day a uh, condo in Hawaii, uh, one of the things you can do is the uh, bird count at that site. Um, you do need to get an, a, a, an account, and um, I'm not going to go into details on how to do that, but you can go to the Great Backyard Bird Count website and uh, set up your, 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 your own account. Um, and what, you know, what do people learn from all this? Well, it takes a long time to absorb thousands and millions of bits of data, but the scientific bird community can start looking at migration patterns, year-year changes, you know, who's disappearing, uh, who's showing up new, uh, and long-term trends. And I think that's the key right there is long-term trends in specific areas. Um, and I'd like to see more of that in our, our particular area in Snohomish County. Now, there may be, I'm assuming there's some of you that are not in Snohomish County that may be even elsewhere in Washington or elsewhere in the, in the country right now, but are, uh, so this applies to everybody, all right? Uh, what do you do? Well, first of all, you count birds anywhere for at least 15 minutes. 15 minutes is kind of a baseline, uh, but you can go a lot longer if you wish. I often, uh, will start out thinking I'm gonna do 15 minute count and I end up uh, out there 40 minutes later with a list of 10 species of birds that I counted in my yard. So I write down the end time. Then I bring that data in to my uh, computer, I'll go online and, and we'll go talk about that a little bit more. So you need to keep track of not only the birds, <coughs> but the, <coughs> excuse me, the time you start and the time you stop. And you can do that more than once a day, um, you could do it, you know, 10, 15 minute uh, bird counts throughout a whole day uh, and 10 more the next day, or you could just do one each day, or you could just do one. Um, uh, there's an item there called best estimate on the number of individuals for each species observed. And here's where I found that a lot of people get kind of confused. So I'm out there looking at, um, you know, I'm out there my first minute or two, I see uh, three juncos, all right? And then I'm looking around the yard or out the front window or something, then I come back and now I see none. And then six minutes later, I look out the front window and I see 10. Okay, and then I stop uh, counting. So what number do you, what, which of those numbers would you put in and how would you treat those three observations? And I know we're not gonna have a two-way discussion here, but you put in the maximum number you saw in any one observation period, okay? So in that case, the three, the zero and the 10, I'm gonna be entering into the checklist when I get back onto my computer, 10 juncos. Can I see some of your heads shake yes, if you understand that? All right, that helps. Let's move on. Um, so again, you'll need a new checklist for each day, a new checklist for each new location, a new checklist for the same place, but at a new time, okay? And now here's the, Here's the details. You're going on. To, you, you need to go on to the Great Backyard Bird Cow website, and I want all of you to between now and next Friday to actually go onto that website and march your way through it, so you can understand <coughs> a number of things: what the some of the rules are for entering data, how to enter data, how to participate. We're not going to go into that detail now. We just don't have enough time but I'm, I'm asking you to actually go onto the website, do homework, study it, okay? 
Um, again, uh, many of you may, some of you may have an account uh, for the great or other, uh, entry portal called eBird or Marlin, Merlin, um, Feeder Watch, whatever. All of those end up being entry ports for data for the Great Backyard Bird Count. If you don't have an account on any of those sites, you can you can set one up by pouring through the Great Backyard Bird Count, uh, and it'll tell you how to how to set up. Uh, you just need some basic information to enter it. Get yourself a little password. Well, I hate passwords. Um, and um, and that's it. Uh, all, all the sightings that you enter will be reported to, uh, to eBird, uh, which is a central site, uh, through the weekend. And you can actually track the number of entries uh, as the, each day progresses. You can also, by the way, get your own data back, which is, I think, important. Um, here's just some of the steps in the entry form. Uh, uh, choose a location. In the upper left, you can't, it's hard to see that fine print there, but there's a window. Um, in which you put your location and you can put something as silly as my backyard or, <coughs> or um, Linwood Costco parking lot, <laughs> things like that, okay? You can find it on a map if you go to the next step on that right window. On the left, you can see more information uh, that you can put in about your uh, location. I'm going through this quickly, but Here's a sample map that somebody set up uh, where they put a bunch of people's uh, locations in there for New York. Um, the other thing is you gotta put in some information about the effort, effort being how many minutes uh, you spent on a particular, developing a particular checklist. So, um, so you put that in the lower part of this window. In the upper part, you can put in whether you're stationary or traveling and traveling doesn't necessarily mean that you're not holding onto your steering wheel and just writing a list. It means that you've moved from, uh, you've moved and stopped and moved and stopped and moved and stopped in one uh, time period. Um, and then incidental means, well, they want you to, to note whether you <coughs> are reporting all the birds you see or once in a while I'll see, I'll just be looking out the front door and I'll see a a bald eagle fly by, and that's it. Um, that's an incidental observation. I, I would enter that as a you know a one-time, one-shot, not 15-minute uh, observation. Let's move on. So we're we're marching. It. Finally, we get to the guts of this. This is a the top of a checklist of birds, and the, for our area in Washington, the, um, once you put in your location, then when you go to this checklist to type in a the number of each of these birds you've seen, it'll be a checklist for our area or your area. Uh, that, that might be, a, um, if you're in, in Edmonds or in Seattle, it'll probably be Western Washington or something like that. So it, it won't show all the birds in the United States, all six or 800 species. It'll show maybe three or 400 at the most uh, to help trim down the list. So you scroll down that list and type in the number of each of these birds that you've seen. Okay, moving right along. And then if you screw up like I do every time, then it'll hi highlight uh, some red things. Please explain or, or re retype in whatever you've entered, just like your tax return or something. Um, here's an example of somebody has put in a couple of entries. In the lower right, once you get down to the bottom of this, uh, check sheet, you, uh, you hit submit. See the, lower, the green button in the lower right? Okay. But before you do that, you have to check. Uh, there's a little item. It's hard to read. I'll read it to you. Uh, are you submitting a complete checklist of the birds you are able to identify? And you can say yes or no. And you need to check one of those before you can, it'll let you submit it. All right. So, <coughs> uh, you, oh, there's another page missing from this, but it'll, it'll be an example of, okay, here's your, your complete entry form. Uh, do you like it? You can say yes or no. So after you submit your count, you can review and edit then. That's what I just described to you. Share your list with others who, who uh, are compiling a list. If you're associated with a group and want to share, there's ways to do that. 
And then you can also, before you leave that uh, final page, you can submit another list. If you've done one in the morning and one in the afternoon, you can go back and type in the next one, the afternoon list. So that's basically it. Um, I'm just sharing the basic PowerPoint for this um, that the uh, great backyard bird count people have put together. So I'm gonna escape that. Now, let's see, what am I doing? I need to un, let's see, do I type new share or, let's see, I wanna close this. Oh, I did, I just closed it, all right. So now I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, and let's see. Why is something simple always complicated? Let's see. What am I showing? Be patient. Um, what do you guys see? Ah, okay. Um, it's time for a quiz, class. Are you ready? Time for a quiz. <laughs> Bev is smiling. Um, I'm going to show you. Okay, here's the here's the thing. When you're out in the, your yard or looking out your window. <coughs> you don't have a lot of time to, to study a bird. You have, you can see it, you, you can look for a couple of features of it and then boom, it's gone. And another bird comes by. So um, I want to get you used to the idea of uh, more quickly looking at uh, features of, of common birds so that you can, um, particularly after this uh, session, if you want to go and, and see if you guessed right on some of them, you, you can do that. So I'm going to show you photos of birds in typical yard scenes. These are not the pretty pictures you see in the in the guides. These are just the birds hiding in the bush kind of stuff, okay, which is the way you'll see them. Okay, you have one minute to name the birds, but I'm going to give you, I don't know, I should have told you to get a, pen, a pencil and a piece of paper to write down what you see. So if you have something to jot with, you've got maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half when we start this to jot down what you what you see. On your mark, get set, go. Hope this works. One, two, three. I'm gonna just shut up for a while and let you write down the number, write down what you think the bird is. There's a trick in there too. There's nine photos, but there's 10 birds. Thirty seconds. I'm watching the clock. Can you still hear me? All right, put your pencils down. Here we go. Number one, red-breasted nuthatch. Go back. Okay. Number two, black-capped chickadee. Hiding in the branches there. Number three, there's both a dark-eyed jungle and a house finch in there. <coughs> two little brown birds. Number four, the bush tits. Number five, European starling. Number seven, number six, chestnut-backed chickadee. Whoop. Um, uh, num number seven is actually the, the uh, uh, Stellar's Jay. Um, eight is some, a bird I haven't seen for a long time, a house sparrow. <coughs> Last time I saw one was at Starbucks in downtown Edmonds. And number nine um, is a pine siskin, and that's significant because we're having, at least in Edmonds here, tons of pine siskins this year. These are all winter type birds, uh, some in, in the summer, but mostly winter. <coughs> so what? Oh, here's just a few more. Um, we're not going to spend much more time, but we have just jot down what you think you see there. <coughs> just 
Excuse me. Okay, so what we've got in the upper left is a, a varied thrush. They're co very common, at least this year they are in the winter. Robin, uh, tohi, spotted tohi on the upper right. Um, the uh, flicker, uh, the downy woodpecker, and a song sparrow. Okay. Now you can review these since it's going to be since it's being recorded. So, all right, let's get out of there. We'll close this. Ah, there we go. All right. Um, close that. Now, we're going to do something different here. <coughs> you have all, all that guidance you can get from the Great Backyard Bird Count website, but I'm going to give you some personal uh, experiences. Uh, when I started birding, my wife and I started birding uh, 15 uh, years ago in our yard, well, I had all kinds of problems. I didn't know how to use binoculars. I, I didn't know whether to count 10 birds or zero or three on, on that uh, list, all kinds of stuff. So, so I put together something based on my own uh, rough experience in getting going. I call it counting critters. And I'll go past this slide because this is, this is uh, what you need to think about, taking notes, what to record, how often should I observe, where should I observe. And I also designed this not just for the great backyard bird count, but for <coughs> excuse me, helping getting new birders uh, moving so that they would continue um, month after month, year after year to, uh, to uh, start counting birds and, and uh, either using the data themselves or just simply enjoying it or submitting it. Um, so why monitor birds? There's all kinds of things. I mean, I could bring up tree cutting in Edmonds as a big issue uh, around here, with the nesting sites disappearing. Um, monitoring tools. Okay, so basics. So you need some kind of notebook. Um, and here's mine. It's a three by five card in my pocket, right there with a, a pen. All right. Outdoors, indoors, whatever. When I start looking, I simply jot on, on that. But you can use a, a little. Um, more permanent um, pocketbook or something like that. Field guides. <coughs> there are so many field guides. I'll show you a couple that are useful in a minute uh, for, especially for beginners, I think. Binoculars, okay, that's a big issue. Um, everybody has some kind of binoculars. Um, I've talked to people in the past that brought their opera glasses. Those didn't work too well. Um, so we'll, we'll just talk a little bit in a few minutes about that. Um, I know we all have iPhones or something like that now, but I still rely on a real camera, what I call real, um, a Canon or a, a, a whatever, Lumix camera. Um, and I'll show you why in a, in a, in a minute. Um, also, in the past, I've actually put my old video, a high eight camera to use. Um, I don't show anybody the crummy pictures that I take with it, but it has one heck of a zoom lens on it. Okay. So um, I'm not going to go into spotting scopes because that's, that's not our, our, our thing right now. So here's some examples of checklists. Uh, and actually the one in the upper left is interesting because uh, it's from a neighbor three doors down uh, who beginning in early 1990s, started recording stuff. And she loaned me her, her handwritten um, uh, book. Uh, and I was able to understand what birds we used to have in the neighborhood that we don't have now from that. It was in incredible. So I actually scanned it with her permission and I uh, gave it back to her. Um, there's a card on the right there that I, I wrote for one, uh, one list. Um, uh, here's something, this is my checklist for somewhere between 1.10 and 1.40 p.m. Uh, lousy handwriting on February 4th, two days ago. So 
what did I what did I see during that time period? Golden Crown Sparrow, five underneath the bird feeder. Two Tobies, a song sparrow, eight Juncos, a Buick's Wren, Town, Townsend Warbler. Those are really cool. Nuthatch, Anna's Hummingbird, uh, one house finch, also caught it singing, which is uh, really incredible. A uh, black capped chickadee, Pine Siskin, one, but I missed about 400 of them that flew over in about two seconds. Uh, I was, wasn't able to count them. So somewhere between a hundred and a thousand. I'm not gonna write it down, that didn't count. But if that flock had landed in the top of one of my deciduous trees, I would have written down an, an estimate of maybe 200 of them because they were in my yard, at least for a short period of time. My yard was habitat for them or resting place. And that's, that's uh, uh, I think it really important for us to understand. So. <clears throat> My wife and I started out, and we still like that little red book called Birds of Puget Sound Region, and there's also one called um, You know, the pictures are okay, but the descriptions are good. You can put it in a pocket, big pocket of a coat. Um, and then at the other extreme is a Sibley's Guide, which uh, there's a pocket version that's come out a, a year or two ago. Um, much more detail. Um, uh, really beautiful drawings that show features on, on birds that you, you'd, uh, you need to, to help with. Um, so, but then the other thing is, especially now, this week, I can't believe how many birds are singing in my yard. Um, house finches, uh, um, uh, the Buick's wrens are singing like mad. Um, it's, a, it's a real cacophony and I have to run back and forth to figure out you know, wait a minute, which bird is that? Um, there's songs and, and calls on, on the, uh, that you can get to on the websites. <coughs> okay, binoculars. So this is what I use right here. It's a Nikon, uh, I wear glasses, not right this second, but um, the, um, uh, the, that pair of binoculars, they're seven by 35. Seven is the magnification. It's hard to read that uh, on, on the side there. And 35 is kind of the width, the uh, view width, how much light comes in. You can't, you can use more powerful uh, uh, binoculars, but then you start getting the shakes. And I, you know, um, it's really hard to focus them. So that's what I use. You'll see my old Hi8 video camera sitting in the bedroom window there. And uh, actually, both upstairs and downstairs, I have some kind of camera on the window sill just in case. I'm, you know, brushing my teeth and a, a Cooper's hawk lands in the shrubs. Um, anyway, just a few tips there. Um, you, you can learn more about binoculars with, by, by Googling, um, but you'll need some kind of advice, okay? Um, all right, for that. I don't, I don't use a spotting scope. Okay, the other thing that I couldn't believe how, why it took me so long to learn don't, you don't want to be hunting all over the place looking for birds with your binoculars like this. What you want to do is stand at your window or in your yard and look and you'll see a movement in a tree or a shrub or at the top of a tree. You point to it, especially if you're working with somebody else, and then you lift up your binoculars and, and look at it. You don't try and find birds with your binoculars. Um, well, you can, but I can't. <coughs> what to record? <coughs> this is old news now. The date, the time start, the, the duration. You can record the weather. Um, and I'll tell you, I, I so enjoy it when it snows because the, the birds are easy to see. They're out and there's tons of them in the wintertime. Uh, the species seen, the count of each species. We've gone, already gone over how to count if you, if you see three, zero, and then 10 juncos, uh, you write down 10. And fixed times. Here, I wanna get people, once you do the great backyard bird count, to continue doing counts, maybe once a week or uh, a couple times a month, um, uh, whatever, before work. If anybody goes to work anymore, I don't know who does, I don't, um, for one reason or another, um, or to fix time, say during a weekend, whatever. And once, if you kind of get in this mode, don't make a big deal out of it. You'll get more and more comfortable. 
uh, each as each uh, week and month and, and year passes by, and you'll suddenly be an expert. <coughs> the other thing is um, a lot of us have feeders and we tend to look at our feeders or around them, but that's not only where birds are. There's only a certain number of birds that will actually come and spend time at feeders, but there's other birds that'll flock with them and not go to the feeders. They'll be in the shrubs or in the trees. So think of your uh, apartment building, uh, your, uh, um, your, your home, uh, your school, uh, um, school grounds as a three-dimensional space, you know, look up and down. And so when I see, see birds at the feeder, I know there's going to be other birds not at the feeder. Um, and so I'm looking uh, at the ground and the shrubs, uh, medium height trees, tree trunks up high in the canopy. And, and by the way, I'm standing there and I've got 10 species on my list and all of a sudden a, a merlin scoots by between the birch trees. Um, took me a while to uh, identify merlins, but once I finally did, I record them. They're part of, it went through my habitat, okay? Uh, so to me, and then if an owl keeps you up at night, wake up, get a piece of paper, write down uh, 1.30 a.m., uh, some kind of owl. And then in the morning you can go and, and uh, look, at, uh, uh, look up owl calls on, and Google them and find out whether it was a, a a barred owl or a great horned owl or whatever. And that counts. Again, where in your yard? I made a little map of where my bird feeders are, the yellow dots. Um, but also, by the way, I also look, I'm standing on my own sidewalk, but there's birds across the street. I can see them. They're in my circle of view uh, at my home. So I can include those as well. There, this is an old slide, so there's, there's many more websites and you can get to even more of them on the Great Backyard uh, Bird Count uh, uh, um, web pages. Let's see, do I have anything else? Um, <coughs> I, I, think, I think not. I think I will um, hold it right there and um, stop for, well, I guess, questions. Brian? Yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, Say, so if you want to, you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen so we can all see each other again. Yeah, let's see. Um, to, to Alan's point about the links, um, I will send out an email afterwards. Um, it'll have the recording, but I'll also put a document in there with some helpful website links for Bird ID and eBird and Merlin and that kind of stuff. Um, so. Uh, we will send you links for those so you don't have to try and find some of that stuff. Um, we do have some questions in the chat, so I will go through and read those out for you, Alan, and we can go through those. Um, first one is, is it safe or will it be safe by next weekend to put feeders out of the den with the salmonella warnings? Um, great question. Um, the last guidance I've heard by DFW was um, to keep stuff down to, until February. I haven't heard if they've updated that yet or not. Um, shameless plug, this coming Friday, uh, Pilchuck Audubon is having a salmonellosis program um, put on by PAWS. And so uh, that's a free program um, Friday the 12th, and you can register um, through that on our website, and I'll include that in the email afterwards as well. Um, we're having a vet talk to us about salmonella and pine cystins, and so um, that will be the day that the great um, backyard bird count starts. And so um, that's as updated as information as you will get before this begins. Um, Alan or Bev, if you've heard any other guidance, uh, feel free to, to chime in. I've heard the same thing you've heard. Uh, I know that PAWS and most of the other Audubon societies are suggesting that we leave our feeders down for a while. Um, I'm still doing hummingbird feeders. And I'm still doing some sal uh, the hot pepper suet. Um, th the reason they're trying to keep the feeders down, it isn't because <clears throat> the feeders are actually going to be killing your birds. It's that the pine siskins are carrying salmonella. And if you have feeders, you have many birds gathering, and that makes it more contagious to them. So they're trying to protect everybody here. If you've got something where you've just got 
like hummingbird feeders, for instance, that only they only bring in hummingbirds. Those are fine to have up right now. Thanks, Beth. Uh, I think we addressed this, um, but just to clarify, if, if we have an eBird account, you can just enter that sites as your bird sightings as usual, or do you need, need to go to the bird count site specifically? Hmm. I don't know. Bill? I think you're on mute, Bev. Sorry. To my shame, I've not done a backyard bird account yet. This will be my first year. Um, I plan on just going through my eBird account. I'm assuming that should work for me. Yeah. That's Fingers my crossed. understanding. Yeah. Um, I think you answered, answered this one earlier too, but uh, for the bird count, um, is it just one 15 minute period per day per person? Um, as you mentioned earlier, people can do multiple um, <laughs> checklists per day and throughout the weekend. Um, so you're not limited to just one per day. Um, and you can do them for as long as you want, but the minimum is recommended is 15 minutes. Right. I mean, I, I think, you know, my neck is better. I'll probably do three 30 minute uh, counts uh, on Friday, next Friday, and enter those. Uh, that's Alan? Yeah. Just don't end up with warbler neck. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, the uh, Townsend warbler is down low. That's fine. Uh, Amanda has a, a, a nice comment here. Uh, let's hope this is more fun than doing our taxes. I promise it is more fun than filling out your taxes. <laughs> oh, my wife has a comment here, uh, Brian. Uh, uh, how do I record a bird I can't identify? I'm, I'm gonna go back to this whole camera thing again uh, because you know people think, oh, I, I'm not a good phot bird photographer. Well. That's not the point. You don't have to be. You don't have to show anybody else pictures you take of a fuzzy bird uh, out of slightly out of focus. Uh, but when you you take that picture, you can then go to the field guides and so on and say, "Oh, I think I think I see what they're talking about." Little white slash on the wing or something like that. And then you can discard the picture if you want. So. Um, cameras, including the old video cameras. I, I mean, I, I really depend on uh, photographs, even crummy, the crummiest ones that I wouldn't want to show you to help me identify a bird. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on to that. Um, if you have a photo of a bird and you really can't figure out what it is, feel free to, to email it to me. Um, I ha I'm happy to help with, with ID. Um, there's also, if you're on Facebook, there are some really good Facebook groups um, I think the one's called Washington Birders, and there's a Pacific Northwest Birders. Um, people on there post pictures and ask for help with ID all the time, and um, that's a really good, great source as well if you're if you're on Facebook. Yeah, and can um, if you don't have a camera or you don't get a picture of the bird, it's a good thing to you can describe it if you give a good enough description. Someone who knows can usually tell you. And the uh, you can put size. You want to put color and shape of beak. What were their feet doing? You know, were they yellow? Were they big? Did they have black legs with yellow feet? And importantly, what were they doing? So if somebody tells me, I just saw a bunch of little birds, they showed up at my suet feeder, there were like 25 of them and some had black eyes and some had white eyes. I know it's bush tits. I don't need to see a picture. And I can say, well, look up bush tits and then they can look it up and they can see it. So give good hints, get good idea of what you're seeing. Yeah, and, and if you don't know what the bird is and you didn't get a picture and you're not sure, um, don't include it on your checklist. Um, it's best not to guess because uh, that will affect the quality of the data that the scientists use this for. And so only include birds that you can identify. Um, if, if you can narrow it down to it's a sparrow species, um, I think there's an option to put like sparrow species on those checklists. But if you really don't know, just, just go ahead and leave it off and just include what you can positively identify. Um, there was one or two questions regarding um, what area you can count for seeing birds. And so, um, Alan, um, do 
you mentioned across the street. So can you count birds that you can see from your yard or do they have to be in your yard? Um, as far as I'm concerned, birds that you can see from your yard. For example, uh, one day across the street, I live in a you know regular suburban area, great blue heron landed on my neighbor's roof. And I thought, geez, should I count that? I want that record. I mean, it's in a suburban area. It's using the roof as a resting place. So, so it's in there. I'm not sure I submitted that particular list to Great Bird Count because it wasn't that time of year. But that's, that's what I do. And I told you about the Merlin that zip by. Um, and also, um, a couple of times each year, uh, gulls land on our roof. They're, they're, they're making use of my habitat. So three goals, even if I can't identify them exactly. Now we have a question about, um, is it okay to do segments from different viewpoints in your yard? Um, yeah, I would say that's fine. Um, if you wanna do them as separate checklists or, or that way, um, that's fine. Um, kind of however you wanna divide up your yard is kind of up to you as long as it's within your yard. And we keep saying yard. If you if you live in an apartment and just have a balcony, like that counts perfect as well too. Like we we encourage people to to do it from your balcony. Um, well, I used to live right by the the I five corridor and the second story apartment, and we had kinglets and bush tits and woodpeckers all up along the the side of the interstate. So no matter where you are, um, you can see a lot of great birds. Um, <laughs> I was laughing earlier because Alan mentioned the Tosco parking lot. Um, I also live near a Tosco and, and when I was in that apartment. And um, I saw last year, I saw in the Tosco mitigation ponds, Snipe. And um, oh shoot, there was something else really, really cool too. And I can't think of what it is now, but I saw Wilson's Snipes in Tosco parking lot. And so um, don't discount those areas. <laughs> and uh, Brian, I want to put a, another plug in for, um, urban suburban birding. Um, you know, we all, we all like, love to go to the parks or in, out in the wilds and so on. But um, from the work I've been involved in with the uh, uh, mayor of Edmonds and conservation committee, we are in dire need of understanding what really lives in our uh, urban neighborhoods and suburban neighborhoods. Um, um, I'm sure a lot of a lot of neighbors actually look at birds and, and, and so on, but they don't necessarily enter them into these databases. So I'm I'm putting a plug in for that. Seen any children or kids on our um, six pages of people? I'm looking, but um, I'm I'm really concerned that we need to to. Yeah, I saw a couple. Okay, uh, we need to get the next generation or two involved in all of this stuff. So, so whatever you guys can do to help out in that. Are yeah, there great, any young birder problem. clubs uh, in our area? I don't know. <clears throat> Brian, do Pilchuck have something? I'm sorry, what was that, Alan? Oh, uh, yes, some kind of a young birders club uh, activity for, for kids. We don't have any youth programs at, at the moment um, in, in terms of clubs or things like that. Um, but the youth are always welcome when we have field trips to come out on our field trips um, and things like that. Um, but yeah, youth is something we definitely want to focus on more in the future. And if you want to volunteer and help us develop programs like that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we rely a lot on volunteers and um, yeah, it's definitely a great, um, a great need in our communities as Alan mentioned. And so uh, I see some of us are a little on the senior side, right? So, and some of us seniors have grandkids as well as our kids. We don't want a big group thing if people are not living with us, but um, hey, you know, bring a grandson or granddaughter. Uh, of course, we have to all observe the uh, six feet apart, uh, wear a mask, period. Uh, so that, that, that counts, but... Um, um, <coughs> Involve your, involve your next generations. Um, 
I'm just going through the questions here. Um, I did put the the link for the Great Backyard Bird Count um, in the chat box just a moment moment ago. Um, let's see. Um, we have a question by about I think this is regards to salmonella again. Um, why isn't cleaning your bird feeder sufficient? Um, <clears throat> first off, um, we highly recommend you clean your bird feeder, um, especially right now, several times a week. Um, um, the reason it's not sufficient is because birds are constantly coming back and forth. And as, and as soon as you clean it, you could have an infected bird there as the next bird back. Um, and so um, cleaning is very recommended and um, a great thing to do um, year round, regardless of whether we have salmonella. Um, but birds are always coming in and out. And so um, it's not a foolproof way of keeping it sterile for any length of time. Okay. Um, same goes for um, your bird baths. Um, you should be cleaning those year round as well, um, not just bird feeders. <clears throat> you have more questions there on the chat? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorting through some of the comments here. Um, let's see. Brian, can I take a break? I got to reheat my heat. Yeah, go for it, Alan. Okay. I'll be right back. <clears throat> Um, so people have had a couple of questions on when, when the count is actually taking place. Um, it's next weekend, so it's February 12th through the 15th is when the official backyard bird count is taking place. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. I, I came in a little bit late. I apologize. I had to pick up my car from the auto mechanic. Um, so the bird count takes place next week, and we're just to stay in our yard or some stationary place and count the birds and 15 minute increments and uh, put, put the data into the eBird system. Is that, did I understand what you, what the goal is? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, 15 minutes is the recommended minimum amount of time. You can go oh. longer if you'd like. Oh, okay. um, and yeah, you can submit it, submit it through um, the Great Backyard Bird Count website, which is essentially the eBird portal, um, the data goes to the same place. Um, and yeah, in your backyard, in your apartment, um, as Alan mentioned, you can go sit in a Costco parking lot for, for 15 minutes if you, if you want to bird somewhere beside, beside your backyard. Um, can you add multiple um, places? Because I have three places I go to to bird watch. Can you do one, then another at a different time, and another at a different time? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, this is, uh, this yeah. is Holmes, and... Uh, I have the Peterson field guides for Western birds. And uh, in that, I have nine pages of warblers. So if I can uh, be specific about which brand it is within the community, is just uh, plain warbler satisfactory? I, I can answer, I think. I, you're probably not going to see a lot of warblers next weekend. You may see a Townsend's warbler. You may see yellow rumped warblers. But frankly, this time of year, they're not going to be around the neighborhood. So figure out. You can actually go on eBird and do whip up a bar chart for your area, and it will tell you. You can look up the warblers, and it will show you when they're in the area. But right now I would cons I would consider learning what a Townsend's warbler looks like and a yellow rumped. Brian, can you think of any others? Uh, maybe an orange crowned, but those are the ones that show up. And then the two kinglets are starting to come in. So if you look at the two kinglets and the two warblers, you'll be okay. Actually, I use that as an a, a example, but uh -huh. there are a variety of chickadees. And uh, so if I don't know the specific uh, which one that is, is. Is it satisfactory to just write chickadee? I would say um, if you if you know for sure that it's a type of chickadee, I think there's probably an option on eBird to put chickadee species. Um, there is, yeah. Yeah, and Don, what area are you in? Edmonds. Okay, there are only two species of chickadees here. And there's the chestnut back and the black capped. And they look, it's easy. The chestnut back has a chestnut back, 
the black cap doesn't. So that should be, that's, that one's a pretty easy for one here because you only got two here in Edmonds. Okay. If that helps. No, it, it does help, yes. But my question is that several uh, birds have a variety of species within the uh, troop. And uh, if, we don't, if we can't identify it, should we leave it out or should we just write uh, chickadee? I think there I is an oh, item for chickadee, you know, unidentified. Yeah. If uh, eBird offers a chickadee species, an SP, then go ahead and put it. Okay. Thank you. You bet. I have some more comments. Uh, I don't know if, how many more questions you have there, Brian, but. Um, go, go ahead with your, your comments, Alan. Yeah. Okay. A couple of things. One is um, another. Uh, thing everybody could go to, especially it lives in the Snohomish County, but is, well, in the Puget Sound area, is the Puget Sound Bird Web, uh, Bird Fest, Puget Sound Bird Fest website. You can go on there and you can see, um, this was held in last September, but uh, most of the things that were presented uh, are, are, are on there and, and live, including a wonderful bird walk uh, narrated by our guest here, Bev uh, Bo. Uh, it's re really exciting. And she walked through Yost Park uh, identifying birds. It's a, a video. Um, I love that it was fun. Yeah. The other thing that's on there is a, um, a kids, uh, a, a list of kids activities and, and um, uh, items and websites and read out loud books uh, for even really little kids. Um, so so don't hesitate to go to the Puget Sound Bird Fest website. Um, let's see, what was my other thought? Well, go ahead with another question while I think of what I was going to say. <laughs> um, you, you kind of addressed this one earlier, but I'll just uh, reiterate it. Um, someone asked, how, how do we avoid double or triple counting birds? Um, basically, you, you use the high count that you see of that species. Um, if you see five juncos, at one point, and then a few minutes later, you see ten juncos. Um, you don't. You, you report ten juncos um, because you don't know if the five from that first group are part of that same ten or not. And so, uh, if you see multiple groups of the same species, go with whatever the high count is that you can see at one moment. Okay. Go ahead with another question if you have one there. <clears throat> Um, we have a, a bird ID question, it looks like. Um, I was driving by a farmer's field yesterday and I saw a bird the size of an eagle with dark feathers and a white ring around its neck. Any thoughts of what that might be? Well, you broke up a little bit, Brian. <clears throat> um, it's, they said I was driving by a farmer's field yesterday and saw a bird the size of an eagle with dark feathers and a white ring around its neck. Any thoughts of, to what that might be? I have a few thoughts. Uh, my guess is it was an immature eagle <clears throat> that was starting to get some white around, starting to get its adult white head. And from a distance, it might look like white around the neck. It's too early for osprey. Um, if you were up in the Skagit, it could have been a rough-legged hawk. Sometimes their coloring looks different enough to where you think it's a white ring. But my guess would be it would be an immature juvenile eagle, maybe third or fourth year. I have another comment. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, this activity has been, uh, over the years, been uh, started by and, and maintained by uh, an association with the Piltruck Audubon Society, and that's the Edmonds uh, Native Plant Demonstration Garden. Um, and uh, Susie Schaefer, I don't know if she's on the line here, but uh, is uh, in charge of that whole activity. Um, uh, we, that's where we had meetings. Uh, the, the garden is being restored with native plants um, as we speak. And so by spring and summer, I uh, encourage you all to, when you're in the Edmonds area, to stop by and visit the native Edmonds native plant uh, demonstration garden. Uh, we're putting in new labels on the plants so you can see what they are. 
But the whole idea is to help people uh, get interested in, in planting native plants in their yards, shrubs, trees, and as well as all kinds of flowers. So a plug for that. I'll, I'll continue that plug because we are, we've had to move to virtual programs and we're having another one um, on, on uh, this 19th. Some of you may be on my mailing list. I have a different mailing list of people who have attended our programs. If you've attended any of our programs, you probably get lots of emails from me saying there's something coming up. And so if you're not on my list, you can register on my list. And because we meet, we've had two or three programs a month. We will get back to live programs. And uh, the birds that are down at, in the demonstration garden are birds that we're going to see in our yards here. And they're not anything, and uh, occasionally we'll get an unusual bird, but most of the birds you can recognize. Somebody was asking about sparrows. Don't spend a lot of time looking for sparrows. We only have a few kinds around here. Um, and we've had, we have had workshops on sparrows and we will continue having workshops that you can come. We have a, we did one on called Little Brown Birds and somebody, ex, an expert came in and showed us the difference between each of the little brown birds. And we'll go back to having those when we can or we'll do them virtually. Uh, if we have to. And we'll, we're, we usually have one or two workshops a, a month and everyone is welcome. They're free. Uh, they're for kids too. So, um, and the garden is open. Anybody who can go in there, it just doesn't look very nice right now because some of our native plants got very enthusiastic and outmaneuvered all the others. So uh, we're taking out some of our Nutka Rose and our... Uh, <laughs> and our goldenrod and a few others that get a little carried away. And we're planting a new, we're planting a new crop and we'll have a beautiful garden in another year. <laughs> yeah, thanks Susie. And for, for those who aren't aware, the, the demo garden is down by the Edmonds Marsh, um, it's down in that general area. So um, yeah, um, it looks like we have a question from Patricia. Uh, Patricia feel free to have the question. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an education, so I always raise my hand, but um, I'm a little confused. Do we only include the birds we see in our own backyards and the sky above our yard? Or, or what? Or do we, can we wander around Edmonds and include things or birds we see elsewhere? If you, I would say that if you're wandering around Edmonds, each place you, you stop at is a new place, a new place to count birds. Okay. Um, I think- You Brian, mentioned seeing the heron in your neighbor's yard and not counting it, so. Well, if it's in your neighbor's yard and you can see it from your yard, count it. Okay, that clarifies that, thank you. Yeah. And one of, one of my philosophies on submitting, uh, we had a question on flyovers. Um, if you see like a, a doll flying 300 feet above your house, I personally wouldn't count that. I kind of lean towards if, if it's interacting with, with the yard. So like Alan mentioned, he had a Merlin yeah. fly through. That Merlin was probably looking, it was probably hunting on his property, um, checking out his bird feeders. Um, and so kind of my rule of thumb is if, if the bird is interacting with, with the habitat, um, I typically count it, but if, it, if it's just, if it's flying way off and doesn't even turn its head to look at your property, I probably wouldn't count it. Somebody asked for my email address and it's very easy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it's very easy because it's garden at pilchuckaudubon.org. I have, we have, some of us have Piltuck Audubon uh, emails, and so I am just garden at Piltuck Audubon, and I'll put you on my mailing list, and you will get emails that tell what's going on around here, and what's going on at the garden, and uh, give plugs for Brian's, for Brian. We're really proud to have Brian as our new executive director at Piltuck Audubon. He's doing a great job. We love him, and um 
so and he's been bringing great programs in and and we'll continue to do that so it's a good website to go to too Phil Chuck Audubon we have lots of information on there and uh, the demo garden doesn't have its own website but we do have a Facebook the Edmonds Wildlife Habitat Native Plant Demonstration Garden Facebook it's an awfully long term but it'll get you there and I'll get you there too. So if you get on my list. <laughs> and, and I am working on a, a, a website page on the Pilchuck website for the Darden. And so that's the work in progress currently. Um, um, can I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Beth. Can I step in just for a brief plug? And this is for everyone. I see so many people are online here today, which is great. And I know there are a lot of new birders here and the city of Edmonds is actually um, in our new waterfront center we're going to have, and I'm going to be teaching evidently, um, a beginning birders class. And it's geared for brand new birders. There's no question too silly. I love working with birders. So look for that. It's going to go through Edmonds Parks, I believe. Mm. Um, and if, you know, if you're shy, my class would be definitely be the first one because we all started and we've all just done ridiculously silly things. And, you know, birding should be fun. So it's, it's something to think about because, you know, the more beginner, the more welcome. Yeah, it looks like uh, Jermaine has a question. Yes, um, I used to buy binoculars from Eagle Optics in Wisconsin, and I understand they've closed down. Where yeah. would be a comparable place to get good quality binoculars now? Bev, do you know I haven't bought yeah. binoculars in a long time? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Seattle Audubon has a great selection. I don't know how they're doing it. They're closed now, but I know that they do have a great selection. If you're a member, you get percent off. Um, if you're not doing that, I, it, you can like Google best binoculars for and it breaks them down into different price points. And then what I actually ended up doing for one of my pairs is I ordered them off Amazon and they didn't work out. So I just returned them. It was easy. It was like, um, but yeah, look up reviews, figure out what you need. But Seattle Audubon, for me, is a real good resource for binoculars and scopes. I would Thank put you. In, I would put in a plug for Wild Birds Unlimited too. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, Wild Birds Unlimited in in Lake Forest Park. Yes. Um, has and and they're also in Everett. Has um, very nice binoculars, and most of the people. Uh, well, actually, I know all the people who work at, at the one here. And they're very good birders and they know their binoculars. And if you say you're a beginning birder, they won't try to sell you, um, you know, a really expensive pair of binoculars if you don't know how to use them. They're, they're, you just need a basic pair of binoculars. Right. If you are, if you have a lot of money, you want to buy uh, the expensive ones, that's fine. But you can also get, get by with just good binoculars. <laughs> Yeah, we have a, a question um, from Deb in the chat. Um, she looks like she's in Western Wash or Western Oregon, um, and asks if she'll see different birds there, or if there'll be similar birds to what we have here in, in Western Washington. And I would imagine a lot of those birds are going to be the same. Um, we did a lot of the same birds along the, the coast of Washington and Oregon, and so in general, I would say they'd be more similar than they would be dissimilar. Let's see. Hey, Brian. Yeah. Uh, can we save the chat questions too? Yes, I will. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I did see a question earlier that briefly came on screen. Someone was asking if <coughs> water, water birds are okay, ducks and stuff. Yes. For the backyard bird count, if they're, yeah, if they're in your backyard or in the spot that you walk. I mean, if you don't have a backyard, but you have a spot, can't you still put that in? Alan, what do you think? Yes. yes. Yeah. So I think water birds great. We've got this is weird duck season. This is great ducks right now. And actually, um, uh, Jennifer Leach at the uh, City of Edmonds Parks and Recreation just published a two-page yes. take it with you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you can go onto the City of Edmonds website, Parks and Recreation Discovery Programs, and I think you can just simply download the, the two-page uh, guide. 
uh, and it's designed exactly for this time of year. With the birds <coughs> that we have yeah, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. Looks Kelly, like um, put a pitch in for that. Looks like Florence has a question. Um, hi. I live in Edmonds, and I have, for the past week, had a sharp shin hawk come and thinks my yard is the lunch counter. So next weekend, do I count him each day or just one day do I put it down? My answer would be each day. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Every separate checklist that you see, you can put it on. Okay, thank you. Uh, looks like Sarah has a question. Hi, thanks. Uh, this is great information. Uh, I used to live in Edmonds and I'm now up in La Conner. Um, so uh, out one door I see an eagle's nest and out the other is the trumpeter swan. So um, plus my backyard. So I'm very blessed with a lot of birds. Um, I have no idea what most of the water birds are, except for the mergansers. Um, and I uh, wanted to know, uh, particularly if it makes sense to go down and there's a s number of spots on the dikes around here um, that are great for harriers and uh, short-eared owls and whatnot. So I don't know if that considered my backyard. Um, that's my question. <laughs> No, it's a location. That's yeah. fine. Okay, because it's pretty. Uh, I'm just getting to know those birds, so I'm uh, still You're near very a lot lucky. of. Oh yeah, it's, yeah. That's winter bird mecca down there, up there. It is. It is. So um, thousands of you know trumpeters and snow geese. The trumpeters are the best. <laughs> that that brings me to another thought, and that's. Uh, I hope a lot of you will continue to do birding at your favorite places because I think it's really interesting, the transition period, when the winter birds start leaving, then what what comes in next in those same habitats? Um, and you know, if you can observe and record periodically and enter that data, it'll it give us a better idea of uh, timing of when birds come and go uh, on a kind of a larger scale. So keep on birding. Um, we have a, a question, Bev. Um, do you know what the date is for your, your beginner's class? Mm. No, what have I done thing? Um, well, tentatively, they asked me to firm up a date. It's April. Let me look at my planner. It's April 6th with a short field trip on the 9th through 1030. And that's hopefully we can have a, we're going to, we're opening up. It's not going to be online. It's going to be in the new venue. So it's maximum 10 people. We're keeping it very PPE. And we're hoping, we were going to do a winter one, but they canceled it. It was just too dangerous. So we're hoping we'll be able to do it in-house. So the sixth and then the following Saturday, a very short field trip where you actually get to come out and look at birds. Excellent. Sounds like a great class, yeah. I, yeah, I, it's, it should be a lot of fun. Um, we have a question. Um, saw five trumpeter swans two weeks ago on Newcastle Beach floating on the lake. Should I enter that data anywhere or is it only on next weekend? Um, so eBird, um, we encourage people to submit to that year round. Um, this, the, the Great Backyard Bird Count is just one weekend that we really try and push everybody to do like, one big effort, basically globally now. Um, as a, as a snapshot in time for scientists to get that data. But um, yeah, eBird is available year round. Um, a lot of us submit to it weekly. Some people are even every day, they're, they're really um, intense birders. Um, but yeah, so feel free to, to submit it. The process is basically the same. You just use your eBird account and the checklist process and all that would be the same um, any day of the week. Um, so yeah, this is, think, oh, go ahead, Beth. Doesn't eBird still have the contest? If you eBird every day, 365 days, at the beginning of the next year, they do a drawing of the people who managed to do an eBird thing every day, and they draw for really nice binoculars, like the big expensive ones. 
So it, it becomes kind of, I did it two years in a row and was always so mad that I didn't win. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's it becomes a challenge. I mean, if you're waiting in line for a movie, you bird and you get your phone out and put a beaver. So it becomes kind of an obsession, but yeah, they have a contest. And, and there is an eBird app on your phone, so they made it really easy now. So you don't have to, to do it on the computer. You can yeah do it all while you're standing in line for that movie. Yeah. Um, another app, I don't know if Alan mentioned it earlier or not. Um, Merlin is a really good bird ID app. Um, it'll, it's really good for helping you identify what you're looking at if you're not sure. Um, it's just called Merlin, like the wizard or the bird. Um, and I'll send the link for that to everybody as well. Um, that's a really, a really useful um, bird ID app. Um, and a lot of this information, I will follow up with everyone in the email after class. And so I know we have a bunch of questions in the chat for links and emails. And so I will send those out to everybody who registered. Oh, good question. Um, About the when information is submitted. Cornell University is the entity that puts out eBird and they compile all this information and give worldwide information on migratory patterns, uh, bird population patterns. It's become just the, one of the most valuable things that we have to help us track birds and how well they're doing. So it's Cornell University in New York. Isn't it New York? I think it's New York. Yeah, I think yeah. it's yeah. They're the bird university. <laughs> and they have a very good website too. Yes. Um, Paige asks, where do we do the list like you showed earlier with all the lists of local birds? Um, that will come up when you some start to submit a checklist on eBird. Um, then they will automatically populate the common birds for the location that you're birding at. And so um, that's really useful. Um, but kind of like we talked about earlier, if there's a lot, a lot of warblers in your book, but you're not sure which ones are local or this time of year, it'll automatically populate what you're most likely to see where you're at for that time of year. You should put in a plug for Pilchuck Audubon's list of birds of Snohomish County. I print that out every year and that, that's, my, that's a great thing if you go to the links on your website. True, yeah, we do have yeah, a, that's a great list. list. Yeah. <laughs> I think I might be caught up on the questions in the chat. Um, does anybody else have any last minute questions? Um, feel free to- I had one, Brian. Answer. Yeah. Uh, it, for the backyard bird count, if we have to take, if we need to take photos to identify later, will we be able to enter them after the weekend? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, you should be able to enter them after the fact and you can back date your observations as long as you have the relevant information that Alan mentioned earlier, like the date and the time and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so you, you can enter data after the fact. Okay, thank and, you. And they're also, when you're putting them in, if you say you found, I don't know, a blue bearded booby, someone in eBird is gonna, it's gonna come up as, uh, we don't think so. It's, <laughs> you'll either get a message saying that would be extremely rare in this area. Can you explain? And that gives you a chance to say, oh God, I, I pushed the wrong thing. Or you'll get an email from one of the people who police eBird who says, uh, can, we need to talk to you about what you put in. And that, that that's it helps everybody. So don't freak out if that happens. Yeah, and, and the birds, the birds were most likely to see on the, the backyard bird count are gonna be your, your mostly your really common birds. Um, but if you did ever report a rare bird, having a photo goes a long way to proving your credibility. <laughs> Easier said than done, I know. Yeah, or if you slip and say, instead of three robins, you slip and say 3,000. Mm -hmm. That might come up with, well, that's pretty large for your backyard. So <laughs> it is just to help you out. Yeah, these have been some great questions. Does anybody else have any last minute questions? Okay, one more plug. Ready? Go for it. Um, next Christmas, if we're through with the pandemic, which I hope we are, then there'll be the uh, annual Christmas bird count. So you might note that. Um, I'm, I'm sure the, the people that are coordinating that um, will be looking for volunteers. 
So if you're a beginning birder, by Christmas time, you're going to be a really good birder, and you can join your local Christmas bird count uh, group. So watch for that, uh, Google it, and uh, that's it. I'm going to fade yeah. out here, Brian. Yeah, Pilchuck Audubon, we, we sponsor two Christmas bird counts. One of them is, is called the Edmonds Bird Count. Um, I think it's centered around Martha Lage is the, the center of that of that circle. And then we also do one in uh, Everett, Everett Marysville area. And so, um, yeah, hopefully, and if you don't live in those areas, that's fine. You can still participate. Um, you can, we can just throw you into one of our, one of our groups. Um, and sure. it's a really great way to, if you're not a great birder, it's a great way to learn because there's yes. some really fantastic birders that go out and they're, they're always happy to teach and help educate. And so, um, don't be shy if you if you feel like you're not a great birder. It's it's a really great introductory activity. Um, thanks so much, Alan. Um, I know you're not feeling the greatest right now, so really appreciate you sticking with us today and and, and going ahead with the presentation. Um, found it really useful and um, yeah, had a, a great turnout. And so really appreciate all your effort putting that together, Alan. Yeah, feel better, Alan. Yeah, thank you. I want thank to thank you. everybody for joining us. This is great. I, I want to thank Brian for putting up with some of my uh, foibles with uh, technology and uh, Susie Schaefer and Bev uh, for joining us and helping out fielding the questions. And I think we've got something cooking here. Uh, we'll do it again. Thank Yay. you. Okay, everybody have a good day.